So you have been, um, I guess, sitting a lot and listening to some very fascinating presentations. I think um, we deliberately have a little bit of contrast and a bit of conflict built into what you've seen because obviously the European perspective, you heard me right at the outset of the day, um, not potentially trying to send the phrases of the day as you, in fact, quite the opposite, quite the problematic about it. And Darko emphasised how there is a different philosophy here driving um, some of the activities that are taking place in Europe. I say some of the activities because I think the generalisation is dangerous. Um, so what we've got to finish off the morning is an opportunity to have a little bit more interaction and a little bit more uh, light-hearted engagement on some of the issues, some in particular the drivers. What we're going to do um, is address a particular moot, um, but before I do that, just a week or so ago, I came across this quote, and I thought I, it was a nice one just for seeding this debate. MOOCs are a bit um, like health clubs more than hospitals. If you haven't seen this, it's quite a nice metaphor. Providing free access to a gym will encourage lots of healthy, motivated people, so on and so forth. It'll be a good thing. Healthier people avoid costly visits to the hospital. We're all going to live longer, so on and so forth. And uh, the quote goes on then to say, of course, at the same time, though, doctors do not um, expect that access to a gym is going to automatically improve health. And I'm sure we've all been in a situation where you at the beginning of a new year or maybe at the summer coming up, we join a gym, but that doesn't mean we go to the gym, does it? Um, so, nice little um, metaphor. A football metaphor is only the unpacked a little bit. So, we're running tight on time, so I won't take up much more. Firstly, this is the motion or the moot that we are going to be debating, and we have two teams here. Unfortunately, one of the problems we have in putting this program together, which I will just express, uh, explicitly address, is we have got a lot of a very, um, done very well on gender balance, and for the debate, that in particular was quite a challenge. Um, if you're not familiar, the whole format of debating. <laughs> Maybe I could invite someone from the floor who might want to replace some of the panelists. Um, there is a little bit of budget. There is a little bit of budget to decide to paint it as a black headway of bias. Let's move on. Um, speakers, speakers in favour. Um, we have, of course, Mike, who's going to lead the um, team speaking in favour of the motion. We had to sort of take two bites of the cherry, Mike, since you've come this far to talk to us. Any woman wants to take my place? <laughs> <laughs> Mike volunteering for a replacement. They'll probably be quite happy at the end of the debate, I suspect, if they happen to lose. Many of you will know Brian, um, who's been, um, I saw on your LinkedIn site at uh, Sligo for many more years than I realised. So just a little anniversary popped up the other Since day. Since I was so, 12. Right. And um, we also have Michael Hallisay, who's going to be talking in the program later on in the afternoon, or actually straight after lunch almost. Um, and Michael's been doing some interesting work, um, background work around boots. On the um, team speaking against the motion, we have Darko. Um, who, uh, I guess you've got a sense of this perspective already. Many of you will know uh, Paul Gorman, he's the, um, is it president or is it, uh, what's the precise term for um, the Learning Technology Association roles? I'm not sure. We have two of them. King, we have King Paul. <laughs> I mean, that sets that team up now. Yeah, that's amazing. And then we have um, Ender Dolan, who's from Matic A. Um, Institute of Education, which is one of the DCU's linked colleges. So, um, probably you've heard enough from me. Um, a little bit of the format, we will keep it really tight, so I'm going to be very vigilant speakers. You will get the cut off. But first of all, you've seen the motion. Um, you need to see it again. If we're going to have a bit of a you see the motion, I may have it there. Let's just bring that back up. Well, there it is there at the bottom. So, we'll just have a little quick show of hands. Those in favour of the motion. Of hands. Those against the motion. Probably about 50 50. Undecided. Yeah, so we're, we're briefly polarised. So interesting. So format is 
We've just had that little vote, and um, at the end, we will use the audience crowdsourcing here to decide on who gets a lunch and who doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably all you need to hear from me, apart from one little qualifier I mentioned about um, the danger of generalisation. We have a favourite quote at the moment, all generalisations are dangerous, including this one. Um, but uh, I guess the thing, as an audience, you're the ones that this, these two teams are trying to win over, you need to have your um, defenses <laughs> well and truly in tune um, for anything. And I encourage a little bit of audience participation if you see any of this going on. So, um, I think in the tradition of a debate, we usually invite the um, uh, positive the team, the affirmative team, to begin the debate. I don't know if you've decided who is yeah, going to be first up. And um, basically the floor is yours and they have three minutes each. Okay. So you can sit or stand, it's up to you. Uh, or dance. No, uh, <laughs> sit if you don't Well, there's no doubt that the internet has opened up learning. I think the last time I went to fix my washing machine, I went to watch a video on the, inter uh, on the internet, and that saved me uh, some money there. My son gets his guitar playing and soccer skills from the internet, and he's far better than I was at his age. Uh, I've been doing a course on stoicism on the internet to prepare me for today, I suppose. Uh, uh, so, which brings me to the first point of why MOOCs have improved on open learning. Because in a way, open learning wasn't catching on. I think it's Don Rumsfeld who's meant to have said that the known knowns are not a problem, the known unknowns are not a problem, but the unknown unknowns are a problem. In other words, people want to learn, but they don't know what it is they have to learn. So MOOCs have provided structure uh, to help them to learn and people were looking for that structure and they got very excited about MOOCs. Now the trouble with that is that raised expectation very high that excitement and uh, if you look at it in terms of expectations, oh it was just going to wipe away existing higher education, obviously it hasn't performed that quickly but signs are there that it is brilliant. In terms of structure, the next stage are programs and what Arizona State is doing or what probably more importantly what Georgia Tech has done with their masters in computing that's very significant because it's a MOOC model that they're using and it's not so much how successful uh, uh, that masters will be that may be an indicator is what is it going to do to the other masters in computing around the United States it's going to be very interesting to watch so it's prizing things open and that's a significant improvement another point I'd like to make is that Apple didn't invent the MP3 player, uh, or it didn't invent the mouse, but it made them sexy, and MOOCs are doing that. People have hardly heard about online learning until MOOCs came. So that's good for us, and it's beginning to make people think that things can be different. Possibly more attention, uh, like, and open learning existed before with the University of the People, Allison, it was there before, and MOOCs have suddenly brought attention to this. Possibly more uh, importantly, and this may be somewhat controversial, is it's drawn attention to costs in higher education. Does higher education have to be so expensive? And this is a thing that higher education is shying away a lot from. They don't want to talk about it, but it's a very important thing to open up for discussion. They raise their hands and say, ah, it's not about costs, it's about quality. As if all teaching in higher education was high quality. I have a daughter in first year in college, half her lectures, she believes, are subpar. Even the ex MOOCs are better than most lectures in college, for all the complaints about them. So it's drawing attention to costs and quality in higher education. It's also drawing attention to alternatives between open badges, professional qualifications. There are other options other than college. So this may actually prize open the card of higher education. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a strong start, I think, for feeling. the uh, affirmative team, and I now invite Paul who had responded. Okay, sisters. <laughs> we know the key words here are disco, second life, wikis, Twitter, disco again, and Kylie Minogue. <laughs> MOOCs are an unwanted and dangerous distraction from a very important quest, I believe, which is to empower and encourage educators to creatively employ digital tools and practices in their everyday practice. Uh, and 
you know, by extension, ex you know, enhance the student experience. Unfortunately, we seem intent on snatching defeat from the jaws of victory on so many occasions in that quest. In terms of entry, participation, continuation, embeddedness, that kind of thing. I offer you three exhibits uh, as, as evidence of this. Second Life. Hopefully some of you don't remember Second Life. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, in, in very kind of a, people used to, some people used to like it. So my, my, as an educator, my experience of, of Second Life is to do control and you, to put up your hand, what I going to put for me, it was kind of, if I did that, I went up. And you did it again, and you went down. And you went up, so I can't be, can be bothered with this. Wikis. A great tool. You brand it as a wiki. It's a, it's a barrier. It's, a, it's an inherent barrier. You, all, you already have to explain and roll back and apologize for calling it a wiki. It's a great tool, but it's another barrier that, 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 that's there. Twitter. Hi, I'm at a conference. Here's my coffee. Boom, boom, boom. Hey, I think that's really good. I'm going to retweet this. It's not an educational tool. It's a communication tool. And in some quarters, you would say it's a narcissistic vehicle for exhibitionists. <laughs> so getting on to this particular uh, uh, area, MOOCs or spooks or zooks or jukes or whatever you want to call them these days, they have brought barriers into this, into this discussion and they are, again, a, a distraction. The cult of celebrity, it is not inclusive for all educators. The myth of student access and success for all, it is simply not true. Economies of scale for content, yes, for learning, no. I would like to leave you with a very powerful metaphor that returns to the to words Disco and Kylie Minogue. In 1992, Kylie's first best of disco record, I do not like disco, was launched. It was full of covers, it was full of disco. She was on her way out. In 1995, Nick Cave, uber troubadour and credibility merchant, did a, did a duet with Kylie Minogue. Suddenly, she was propelled into, into credibility status. The consequence of all this is, in 2014, Kylie has released her 12th studio disco album. Disco is still alive and I'm not very happy. So to conclude, MOOCs is one distraction following a well-worn pathway, a historical trend of unhelpful fads. My plea is, do not be distracted by MOOCs. Uh, it's raining, soup on. Don't follow the others and go with the fourth. <laughs> So, the clue is in the title, Massive Open Online Courses. When you sign up for a MOOC, you're not asked for your A-level certificate or your leaving certificate, you're not interviewed by an admissions tutor, you don't even have to open your wallet. And with Kutchalo, you don't even have to invent a username. You type in your email address, you press a button, and off you go learning alongside 10,000 or 100,000 other people around the world. So, MOOCs in the early days were vilified for lowering standards, for letting anyone join the exclusive higher education club. Instead, MOOC courses have improved the quality of online material. The Open University was pretty smug when MOOCs came along. We had the best online courses in the world. No longer. We're competing against all the other MOOC providers who are producing superb courses from world-leading experts. King Richard III from the team who discovered his remains. The Higgs boson from Professor Higgs. So great courses on history from Dom Deluri from Yonsei University on the history of Korea and China. These are great courses from great people and great universities. MOOCs are the next step in a path towards truly open education. The only took the first step, a major step in the 1960s, in opening access to higher education to anyone, anyone that is who could afford to pay the fees. Now MOOCs are removing that cost barrier. There's still a really long way to go. You have to have an internet connection to be able to access a MOOC. And there are only short courses, but that's changing. As more and more people around the world get access to the internet, not just through desktop machines, but from their mobile devices, from their mobile phones. And all the future learning courses, you can access them on your mobile phone. 
And of course, only 20 million people so far have registered for MOOC courses around the world. That's out of 4 billion adults in the world. So it's a long way to go. One minute. But it's a pretty good start in three years. So MOOCs have opened up education. Have they opened it up significantly? Well, ask 93-year-old Norman, who is an avid future learn learner. Mm -hmm. Ask 23-year-old Rai Bakar, a Syrian refugee, who's taken a future learn course on preparing for university and is now applied to an, open U to an UK university course. These are people who've had their lives significantly affected by MOOCs. So MOOCs are open and they're making a significant difference in people's lives. So, members, uh, ladies of the jury, so <laughs> let's look at the phrase, have significantly helped to open education. Perhaps in the future, but now, no. Why? Let's look at the facts. Most of the participants, I think more than 80%, are well educated live in Western countries, etc. Also opening up. They are opening up for the existing people already having a master degree. No, not, op not opening. Not significantly. 80% already has. Another issue. Opening up education is about removing barriers. What kind of barriers are removed by books? Is it for free? Oh, it's cost. No. But I can study in Germany for free. Oh, you see, oh, perhaps in the UK, the significantly help all the people in Europe, and higher education is free in most countries. So, cost is not a barrier. Open door policy. We already had that 40 years. So, is that new? Did MOOC significantly help open door policy? Yeah, open door policy to the existing people already having a master degree. And open door policy for people already having the digital skills for MOOCs. People have different difficulties with the English language, with the case studies that are dominated by the Western countries, with the, 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 the languages that are in English and digital skills you need. No, it is not open education. It has closed, it is even further away. It's only the people who are well educated living in the Western countries that have access. The need for education is highest in Asia, Africa, etc. They calculated. So Daniel, that we need to have opened one university every week with 30,000 students. You cannot have the teachers, you cannot have the means. You have to have open and online education. MOOCs doesn't go to those people. And don't let you have the anecdotes of one people that perhaps one people did. No, it's just marketing, mark by marketing. <laughs> so no evidence that it significantly helps. It potentially it can, but no evidence now. Ooh. Okay, follow that. Um, okay, so um, I was struck in the title it says Helping to Open Up Education. And it uh, struck me that there's a video on YouTube called Learning to Change, Changing to Learn uh, from Coulson. And at the end of that video, it's well worth watching, it's eight minutes long, very interesting. Uh, Stephen Heppel says that this age that we live in is the dawn of learning and the death of education. And I think what MOOCs are doing, and I agree that they are the first step along the, the line, let's not forget that 2012 was the year of MOOC, this is 2015, so we're early days, is opening up learning opportunities. Why don't I take Marco's point, we can all tell stories, I'm going to tell you some stories of my own. Opening up opportunities for learning. We're based here in Ireland, we're an island nation, uh, I'm currently taking uh, a MOOC from the University of Melbourne, Assessment and Teaching of 21st Century Learning, from two of the gurus in the space, Esther Care, Patrick Rift. The book alone costs 90 euros if I was to go and buy it. By logging onto the course, I get access to their brilliant thinking, to the discussions, and I get access to all of the materials. It's laid out, it's structured, I can follow it very, very easily. Uh, it's an opportunity, it's opening up learning to me, I would like to it's opening up education, and I know to be many more. There are thousands on that uh, MOOC at the moment. So that's my first point. Secondly, uh, I was talking to some colleagues recently, uh, professional learning opportunities in the area of technology and education. They are accessing MOOCs 
constantly for around the world, keeping up to date with names that we can only read in journals. So that's another um, uh, advance for us. For parents, last week I was speaking in the local library about these technology uh, and how it, it, it impacts on our children's lives. Some of the, some of the adults in the, that were there at the talk wanted to know more about Scratch. You may be aware that a group has started this week has been repeated in the area of Scratch from edX. By just telling the parents, they were able to go on and they were able to follow. MOOCs are giving us access to these learning opportunities, to the structure, to engage with other people, to ask those questions that I couldn't ask if I'm over in Nates uh, on, a, on a Wednesday evening. One minute. Other areas that are exploring, that are coming up, is Khan Academy. I don't know how many of your children are aware of it, teachers are aware of it, and actually I heard a lot from Paul about educators, but this surely is about learners. Learners at home, parents, their children, they can access material on Khan Academy and such like. To finish, yes, there are some barriers. Uh, we need a computer and we need access to the internet. But I think if we have an open mind and we're willing to interact, we will all interact in very different ways with MOOCs, but it's certainly a lot better than what it was before the period of Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. So a few quick thoughts on uh, on the debate motion. Um, I was struck very much about the issue of openness in relation to this. So I, to me, questions of openness and ownership have to go hand in hand. And ownership when it comes to this is very, very interesting. We heard when uh, Martin Weller was with us a while ago, he goes a very interesting story of one particular <coughs> university that had made content for a MOOC provider. The MOOC provider then in turn vetoed the university from using that content outside of the MOOC, okay? Now that's a very strange idea of openness or line of terms, okay? Uh, Mike told us when you sign up for a MOOC, sorry to quote directly, when you sign up for a MOOC, you're not asked for, and he gave out a couple of different things. Here's one of the things you are asked for when you sign up for a MOOC. This is from one of the terms of service from a MOOC, and I looked at four, and this is not just one, they're very much the same, okay? From a student perspective, by submitting your user postings to the site, you hereby grant to MOOC provider a worldwide, non-exclusive, transferable, assignable, sub-licensable, fully paid up, royalty-free, perpetual, irrevocable right and license, and are finished, to host, transfer, display, perform, reproduce, modify, distribute, redistribute, Relicense and otherwise use, make available and exploit your user postings <laughs> in whole or in part, in any form and in any media formats and through any media channels. And this is my favourite bit. Now known or hereafter developed. <laughs> <laughs> That's not future learning. This is <laughs> All right, bring me my right. first definition or redefinition for the term MOOC. Muddled opinions of ownership and copyright, perhaps mischievously obtaining others' content. <laughs> Second point when it comes to MOOCs, we heard some very good work this morning about the pedagogy and the, the, the issue of pedagogy around MOOCs, but we do know, and this was acknowledged this morning, that a lot of the pedagogy behind existing MOOCs is very, very bad pedagogy, okay? There's a very good study by McGarry and al. from last year, 76 MOOCs looked at, okay, executive summary, content good, organisation good, uh, instructional design bad. Okay? This is something we need to be very, very careful about when it comes to MOOCs. We are actually putting old me methods into these MOOCs. Okay? They are largely underpinned by linear patterns, transmission focus, and almost behaviourist methods of learning and assessment. That's New term to this one. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly open and outdated concepts. Or so Memory of the old chalkboard. Fun. Move on to other communications and missed opportunities for online creativity. I have others, but I'm going to stop. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> I think we will uh, skip the questions and let you engage with the panel members over lunch. I'm conscious we're between lunch. But let's have a little bit of a um, sense of how successful our panel with panelists were in engaging, um, and I think was a reasonably light-hearted, but also serious way with the questions. So we had the original show of hands. Can we now have a show of hands in the final vote? Those in favour of the motion, and those against the motion. Do you think we would say, <laughs> well, let's call it a tie.